Good morning, Kahal Kadosh. Beruchim Abayim to everybody. Good morning, Kahal Kadosh. Beruchim Abayim to everybody. Today, Wednesday, the twenty-first day of Shevat, corresponding to the third day of February. Today's class has been graciously sponsored by Rahel Alfasi and her sister, Sarit Warman, Le'elu Nishmat, Mrs. Ruth Michan Cohen Dehilu Bat Latife, Alea HaShalom, and as well as the Rafwa Shelema of her husband, Haim Obadia Abdo Ben Zehie Hilu, among the Holim of Am Israel. Today's Gemara discusses the topic of loans, financial loans, that is part of the topic that we are going to be discussing today. Uh, I'll give you like a heads up that we're going to be discussing several items related to financial loans. I will strongly suggest that if a person happens to have a particular situation or a particular question, should not perhaps derive the conclusion uh, to your question based on the Gemara of today, since there could be many aspects that can uh, change the outcome of that particular question, but I'm only creating a certain level of awareness to understand how the Torah looks at the loans. Additionally, we will discuss, Be'ezat Hashem, the topic of interest and the concept of uh, some, some part, some part of financial uh, investments. So the Gemara begins, Tane Rebiyosi, we learn with Rebiyosi, there is a pasuk in the Torah that says, Im kesef talve et ami. Literally, this pasuk refers to the concept of lending money to a person. Kesef talve et ami, the pasuk writes, et he'ani imach, to the needy that is with you. Now, the pasuk is very... Uh, interesting the way it's written. The Pasuk says, Im kesef talvet ami, when you lend money to my people. So what the Gemara is teaching from us, ami benochri. Let's say that if a Yehudi is coming to ask you for a loan, and a Gentile is coming to a loan, to ask you for a loan, who do you have the spiritual slash emotional responsibility to try to work with one person, the Pasuk says, Ami. Ami means a Yehudi. I will discuss the differences between a Yehudi and a Gentile. Ete ani imach. Ete ani imach literally means the needy that is with you. What do we learn? Ani be'ashir. If a needy person needs a loan, and a rich man needs a loan. The Torah says, Ani first, because the needs of a poor person are greater than the needs of a rich person. And I know what I'm saying. Somebody may say, Rabbi, the lifestyle of the rich and famous require much more funding than a, a, a pauper, than a needy person. I don't disagree with that way of thinking. But the Gemara doesn't think that way. He says the wealthy may be sure $250,000 to buy a property, to buy, to make an investment. But for the needy, this could be for him finding a way to properly support their family that is financially struggling. That is the meaning of the Pasuk according to today's Gemara. Now the Gemara goes even further. Aniecha. If you have now two needy people that came to ask you for a loan, Aniecha, close to you, or a poor person who lives in your city, who do we do it? Answers the Gemara, Aniecha, Kotmin. The priority you give it to those that are close with you. Number, number one. Number two, the Hafez Haim writes in Ahavat Hesed that even a close relative 
happens to be in a different neighborhood or in a different city where you live, the still the family priority, which it makes a lot of sense. And let me clarify one thing. According to the Shulchan Aruch, there is also a mitzvah to lend money to a rich person. Somebody called me the other day. Says, Rabbi, I need X amount of money. For what? For an investment. I said, my bank balance doesn't have that amount. I'm sorry. No, maybe you know someone, ta, ta, ta. Baruch Hashem, I didn't have to get involved. He got it from elsewhere. So you understand? Yes, there is a mitzvah de alacha, right? That if somebody comes and asks you for a loan, you, if you have the means, and you can afford uh, to give a loan, meaning to say, sometimes people ask me for an advice. Rabbi, uh, this person came and asked me for a loan for a business loan. So through experience, through years of experience, Baruch Hashem, I ask a series of questions. What if he doesn't pay you? Can you afford to lose it? Is this money for your day-to-day -day living or for an emergency situation? And many times people are thankful that I open their brain a bit to think because even though they get excited, perhaps they do some return on their money, which is a prohibition from the Torah, which is called Rebit, which will be part of the Gemaras of today. Uh, but there, are, there is a, 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 a rabbinical concept known as a Tera Iska, a legally and allegedly binding document uh, that alone becomes like an investment, so to speak, and the person receives a return on that investment, etc. So it says a Gemara, that the Alaha rather, that there is a mitzvah to lend money to the rich person. But if you can only afford to make one loan, who you should give it to first? So according to today's Gemara, a needy person. When a need, two needy people come, one is close to you, meaning to say related to you, and one is not. What is the Gemara says? Give it to the close relative to you. Your family is priority. Is that we discussed a while back, and I said this to a couple the other night. Priority when it comes to Hesed, priority to spend time at home, family is priority number one. Yes, it's important to do Hesed outside of the home, it's important to do a lot of beautiful things outside of the home, but if a person does all these Hesed and all these things outside of the home at the expense of family and uh, paying attention to the wife and to the children, it's questionable if that Hesed really has the good value that we all want it to be. And God forbid, we're not saying that a person should not do Hesed, but a person needs to understand that there is time for family, like there is time to pray, like there is time to learn, there is time to work. As Shilomo Melech says, La kol yesh zeman va'et tahat shamaim. There is time for everything under the heavens. The person must manage their time. Uh, as we learned a beautiful shiur last night with Hacham David Yosef, that gave a magnificent class in the Nambi Kolel uh, in our city, the importance of time management, that a person has the fixed time to learn, a person has the seder of the day, a person wakes up, whatever steps go throughout the day of the person. Now, comes the Gemara and it says, Amar Mor, Ami ben Ochri, when you asked me the first question earlier today, if a Gentile asks you for a loan, or your brother asks you for a loan as a Yehudi, Peshita, it's obvious because the Pasuk says, Im kesef talve et ami. So what's the, the, the novel idea that the Gemara is sharing with us? Be ready for this answer. It's a fascinating answer. Answers Rabuna in the name of Rav Nachman. I don't mean Rav Nachman of Breslev. We mean Rav Nachman from the Gemara, 1500 years apart. 
לא נשרכה דאפילו לנוכרי וריבית ולישראל בחינם. You know what is the great idea of the Talmud based on the Pasuk of the Torah? That if you have a choice, you can lend money to a Gentile and you collect from him interest that there is no Torah prohibition to charge a Gentile interest. But there is a Torah prohibition to charge a Jew interest because he's your brother. So you have a choice. Lending to a Gentile with interest or lending to a Jew without interest. What is the Hiddush of the Gemara based on the Pasuk? Priority to lend to a Yehudi without interest rather than lending to a Gentile and making money on your loan. On, it's, a, it's a fascinating Hiddush how the Torah is telling us not all the time money is the priority one in life. And obviously we know very well that people who put money as the first priority in life, they, they need to upgrade their life in a more meaningful way. Because God forbid, God forbid, in the name of money, has shalom, it changes the person. It, the person allows themselves to act and to say and to do things which otherwise are not a really permissible by the halakha. Now, but interesting enough, there is another angle based on the Ahavat Hesed that if a person livelihood depends on the interest from the loans, let's say that a person is an official lender, okay? And that is the reason why uh, when it comes to, I don't want to go too deep into that now, the Gemara will speak about it soon, but when it comes, let's say, to a, a mortgage, for example, right? Let's say somebody wants to buy your apartment or wants to buy your home and you're willing to hold the mortgage and you're gonna charge him the same rate that the bank does with the exception that you're gonna give an expedited approval and certain no penalties based on the agreement. You need to do halachically a heter iska. You need to make a special document that will allow you to collect halachically permissible the, the rate if it's 3%, 3.5%, 4%, depends on the interest rate on the street, to, co to be able to collect, because now, even though you are considered the mortgage holder, but this is also looks like a loan, and is paying you more than the capital, that's called the concept of interest. So therefore, according to some opinions, it says, if a person is a lender, and a Jew came to you and is asking you, lend me money without interest. And a Gentile comes to you and it says, lend me money and I'm willing to pay the interest. If your livelihood depends on this extra income, then according to some opinions, you may be allowed to lend to the Gentile because you bring livelihood to your home. As I said in the beginning of the class, I'm throwing just ideas to open up our eyes, to open up our mind, to understand that even when it comes to the concept of money that is so personal and so private, still there are halachot that are relevant to make sure that the money that a person uh, utilizes for life, for the family, for tuition, for, for tzedakah, for donations to the synagogue, is also something that we call in Jewish law, mo kosher money. Like there is kosher food, there is kosher money. Like there is kosher uh, cell phones, like there is kosher suits, there is kosher sushi, there is also kosher money. And that's why, if you remember the very famous, famous Gemara from Eruvin, I believe that says, Adam Mikar Devarim. The person can be recognized in three aspects of life. Kiso, koso, kaso. Kaso means the anger. The koso means the drinking habits. And kiso, the financial matters. How the person handles finances in life. And although many times that can be understood 
as a person that has a, a generosity, nedivut, or a person that is a kamsan, a person that is stingy, but that's not enough. The idea of the money means in many areas. Are you easy, easy to give? Are you a good person when it comes to provide for the wife and the children? Uh, you know, and yes, it sounds strange, but there are people who need a little bit of a shiur, uh, how to provide for their families uh, in a good way, in a respectful way, and not waiting till the wife asks him, uh, I need money for the grocery, I need money for the babysitter, I need money for the hadame. There's certain things that when it comes to money, also is very uh, important. Continues the Gemara. Amari Biosi. Concerning the lending with a ribbit. So it says, Bore, Rabbi Yossi says, Come and see, Samyut Anehem shall malve berbit. How those who lend with interest, their eyes get blinded. And I don't mean, God forbid, necessarily in a physical way, but suddenly there is a roadblock in their eyes because they see the income, the profit, etc. Adam korela haverora sha. If someone, God forbid, which is a prohibition, to call another person wicked. Yored Aimole Hayav. And it says that the insulted person is offended. And literally he 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 he, he is miserable. Why? Very simple. Because she explains that this type of mistreatment, the mistreatment of a person, has the shalom can be, and it is actually, more painful than if he would have been beaten up in a physical way. And we know this fact. We already learned this two weeks ago when the Gemara discusses the importance of the proper communication I'm speaking between husband and wife. And the Gemara mentioned, remember that hurting someone with words is more painful than hurting someone physically or hurting someone financially. And God forbid, we're not trying to minimize all these other two cases, but I think that the Gemara is trying to tell us that how careful a person needs to be with the interaction between people and, and their marriage. But comes the Gemara and it says, those who lend with Rebid, maybe him, and they write a promissory note, maybe him, Adim, they bring witnesses to testify on the document of the loan, belavlar and the scribe to write the document, bekulmus udio, they bring a pen and ink in the other ways, they have it already, bekodmim behodmim, and they write the document, ze, this fellow who is lending with interest, kafar beloke Israel, he is denying the essence of Hashem. Why? Short answer. Because when a person is about to lend money to another Yehudi and has a document and has the witnesses, and why do you need to have witnesses? Because the Gemara writes elsewhere, which probably will come up soon, that a person who, lend, who wants to lose the money make a loan without witnesses, irrelevant of the interest. But this fellow wants to make it official. He wants to write a promissory note with the capital, with the interest, and he makes it Yani Kasher. Look, I follow the Gemara of not lending money without witnesses. But that's beautiful, Hazak. That's an advice of the Gemara to protect the lender. But the prohibition of charging interest is far more serious than lending money without a document or without witnesses. What could be the worst thing that happened? The person says, you never lend it to me. Maybe in the time of the Talmud, this was more relevant because money 
was given by coins and whatever goods they had. Today, loans are more sophisticated. Many times it's in a form on a check and you write loan on a check and then you get a copy from the bank that it was cash by the recipient. There are many ways and you can write a promissory note. Just don't put any interest like we do in our beautiful program uh, that I spoke about it, Yatra Hameno, that there is an angel fund available for those who need a loan, obviously interest-free, Baruch Hashem, I, up to 10 months or a year to pay, there with certain limitations, and that is done to enhance and to help you succeed in your life, to become a better provider. But we do have a promissory note, and if the borrower doesn't pay, we collect from the lender, Mahila, from the cosigner, but without any type of rebit involved. That is the beauty of the mitzvah of lending. So in this case, we're not only fulfilling the mitzvah of lending money, but actually we're helping someone to stand up on the, on the two feet. And it's a pasuk in the Torah. Behezakta bo. It's a mitzvah to support our brethren. Continues the Gemara. Tanya. Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar Omer. Kol mishe yesh lo ma'ot. A person that has money. Umalve otam shelo beribit. And lends the money without interest. In the world, in the Jewish world, there are different types of lenders. One is a private person. You approach someone. I have a certain need. Can you lend me? I'll pay you X amount monthly, six months, a year, hazard. That's one type of lending. The other one is called gemach, gemilut hasadim. Programs, which many synagogues have it, and they allocate a certain amount to lend in certain needs, in certain occasions. So the Gemara writes, those who lend money, Shelo beribit, without chanting interest. Alaba katu omer, upon this person, the Pasuk says, beautiful Pasuk, Kaspo, Lonatan Beneshech, he has not given money with interest. Besho had anaki, Lonakah, and he had not taken bribe against the innocent. Ose ele, whoever does this, Lo imot le olam shall not falter to e forever. What does it mean? That a Kadosh Baruch Hu will protect the person financially. Halamata, from here we learn, Shekola malveveri bit, a person who lends money with interest, Nechasav bin motetim, his possessions will experience, God forbid, God forbid, some type of setback. Why the possessions? The possessions is like money. Could be a piece of land, could be a house, could be merchandise, could be cash, but it has a certain value. So the fact that a person made money in a non-kosher way, part of the tikkun of this person will be that some of the good money, kosher money, it, it, it falters. Falter means that it's gonna go down. And therefore, the Gemara seems to insinuate to us that when a person fulfills the mitzvah of lending and interest-free, that is the ultimate beracha that a person can have for the well-being of the person's assets. I repeat, there are certain halachic situations that a person will be allowed to collect some return on their capital, but this needs to be done under rabbinical guidance and supervision, and this is called in Jewish law, heter aiska. For example, all banks in Israel, to my knowledge, have this uh, document and this halachic binding contract. Why? Because they lend money. They have a credit card system. They have a mortgages, they have loans. So then banks are not there to make hesed, but of course, there are banks who do chesed all day long. Beautiful. But banks, is understood that a bank will charge a fee. 
that a bank will charge a certain rate. So for that, you will need a heter iska. Also, I don't remember the name of the mortgage company, very important in America, a Jumbo, not Jumbo, different name, that the CEO of the company is Jewish, or the owner of the company, very uh, charitable. And when he became aware of this, he did sign a heter iska. And you have no idea how many multi-billion dollars that company has in the in the in the mortgage industry. And he did it. And he did it. I'm trying to see the company from Detroit. It's a very, very generous individual. It's out of um, from Detroit, the way I understood from his biography, from Michigan, and he's involved in many, many interesting companies. But nevertheless, this is when he became aware of all these matters, he made a hetera iska from his company. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let me see if there is one more in this particular case. Okay. With that being said, we're going to switch the topic at this moment. We're going to continue what we started yesterday with the great lessons of the Bihain Palachi on the topic of the Shobabim, which we still are, and it's good every day of these few weeks to learn and just to recall beautiful things for our life. Okay, we learned at the end yesterday uh, the concept of happiness when a mitzvah is being performed. The topic of happiness is not a new topic. It's a topic which is very important in life, not only for the performance of the mitzvah, but overall as a way of life we all remember the Pasuk that says in the morning prayers, I do it Hashem Besimha. We serve God with joy. Mizvah Gedola, that's from another sefer that says, Mizvah Gedola liyot Besimha Tamid. It's a great mitzvah to be happy. The Benishai writes that when a person does a mitzvah with happiness, it doubles the reward of the mitzvah. What does that mean? That if the mitzvah by itself, let's, let's use a hypothetical case, is a hundred points, for example, doing it with simcha, it became double point. Like, simple. That's what the Benish Hai writes. Shalom HaMelech says, ani et simcha. I praise happiness. Because happiness gives the person the opportunity to grow, to grow in life, self-esteem, and well-being all around. Additionally, the Gemara writes, Godliness can only dwell when there is happiness. If there is sadness, Hashem takes a step back to the person. And that's why so, much, so many things are written about the dangers of sadness or depression and obviously uh, i'm not a doctor but i do understand basically that when a person is affected by this type of condition 
it's, it's an overall condition that affects the essence of the person. Now we need to understand, and I have to say this, some may take it, some may not, that sometimes, and that's what I think it says in the name of the, the, the rabbi of Kotsk, Menachem Mendel of Kotsk, he says that the depression sometimes is not because of situations in the life of a person that sometimes can create some level of bitterness or unhappiness, etc. But many times depression or sadness becomes a tool of the yeserara that doesn't want the person to develop their potential. Now, is there a magic pill that can remove depression? Honestly speaking, you gotta speak to your doctor. I don't know their answer to that. Probably yes, there is something. But part of the antidote of depression is emunah in Akadosh Baruch Hu, is simcha, understanding and counting the blessings that we have in our life. And all positive things, as I said this the other day, I believe, when a person, even in the face of adversity, puts a positive twist, that alone starts changing the negative into the positive. And unfortunately, and that's where it comes, the main point of this brief concept about happiness and sadness or depression, that God forbid when a person is down in spirit, not only necessarily spiritually speaking, but in the spirit of the person, that down feeling of in spirit of the person, God forbid, may lead the person to sadness, and that sadness may lead the person to act in ways which are not permissible. If it means staying in bed all day, or not praying, or God forbid, God forbid, transgressing the topics of the Shuvavim that we are talking about. Additionally, one of the messages that Rabbi Haim Palachi brings down is to be careful with wine or alcohol, which obviously we know that this concept is not limited only to the time of the Shovavim. Remember the Gemara that I quoted before? We mentioned Kiso, Koso, Kaso. What's the meaning of Koso? Koso means the cup, meaning to say the cup of wine, drinking alcohol. And it says that a person, the person should avoid drinking wine unless it's for a holy occasion. Kiddush, Avdala, Sa'uda Mizva, Birkat Amazon, let's say Yav Shiva Berachot. And you do wine on the Shiva Berachot at the end. Chazao Baruch, not a problem. Berit Milah, you have to drink a bit of wine for the Kiddush of the Berit Milah. A Chopa, a Mosei Shabbat Melave Malka, a Sa'uda Mizva, whatever. All that is fine, but to drink wine socially, especially during the time of the Shovavim, it seems that is perhaps a step down from the level of holiness. And the reason perhaps could be is that the wine may conduct the person to a certain level of feelings and that may lead the person to act in ways in a proper way. Additionally, he says, Ula dahat piv, Ben Dagim Levasar O Legevina, and a person during the time of the Shovavim should be careful, which many of us do throughout the entire year, to rinse our mouth between fish and cheese or between fish and meat. And there is such a concept in the Alakha. This is called Maim Emsaim, the middle waters. What does that mean? Maim Rishonim is the Natila before we eat bread. Maim Aharonim is the washing of the fingertips before reciting Birkat Amazon. And then we have the middle water. What is this middle water for? This is to separate, to clean the fingers between the touching of dairy and fish or between the touching of fish and meat. Obviously on Shabbat, this is more relevant because many people, uh, Baruch Hashem, they eat fish on Shabbat and the Alakha says, Eat something in between, like a piece of bread, and drink some water, rinse your mouth, 
Again, is it mandatory like washing of the hands before Natila or my Maharonim? The answer is no. But definitely something that the Alaha quoted from the Gemara encourages uh, people to do. Additionally, he says that a person uh, be careful looking at the opposite gender. And it's more a message to the men saying, be careful with your eyes. This is known as Shemirat Ha'inayim, because the eyes are uh, the windows to the soul, so to speak. That's, I believe, the way we call it. And therefore, what the eye sees, the heart desires. And that can lead the person eventually to reactions physically or emotionally or mentally in the brain to the point that can affect the person and lead the person to act in a way which is not appropriate for a Jew to do so. Now, obviously, you're walking on the street, you're not going to walk with your eyes closed. Obviously, you need to see where you're walking. But the idea is, if you see, turn your head a bit. Sometimes you see driving on the circle and you see people the way they dress. You don't have to know the label of the brand uh, that they're wearing. You don't have to keep looking just to see and looking at the color of the pants. Has shalom. Um, it sounds sarcastic, but that's the idea of what he's trying to say. It says avoid doing it. Another one he says, interesting. Going up to the Sefer, the Aliyah of Shishi. Now, what's the idea of the Aliyah to the Sefer Torah? We discussed this in the early steps of Rabbi Haim Palachi that says, look at the letters of the Sefer Torah because they purify your soul and your eyes. So when the Sefer Torah comes out, right? Carry the Sefer Torah open and people look for a word that begins with the first letter of your first name. When the Ole, the person invited to the Sefer Torah gets the Aliyah, he also needs to look inside to see where the Baal Kore will start from and then says the Beracha and then you look back again and you should read together with the Baal Kore in a low tone, obviously, not to disturb the reading. But what about which number of Aliyah? So we need to understand that the Aliyot have Sadiqim connected to each Aliyah. The first Aliyah, Abraham. The second Aliyah, Ishaq. The third Aliyah, Yaakov. The fourth Aliyah, Moshe. The fifth Aliyah, Aharon the sixth Aliyah, Yosef, and the seventh Aliyah, Mosh, eh, David Melech, Alav Shalom. So this is what's written in the holy books. And therefore, it says, in the weeks of the Shovavim, the person should make the effort. If they can, don't fight for it, but if they're selling it, or you like to ask the Mesader, is the sixth Aliyah available? He may tell you, yes, for sure. Says, no, we reserve it for someone else. Okay, not a problem. Again, it's only a suggested uh, concept from the behind Palachi. Why the Aliyah number six? Short answer. The Aliyah number six connects to Yosef as Sadiq. And Yosef is representative of the Middah of the Yesod. What does it mean? Remember in the time of the Sefirata Omer, we explain how the seven weeks of the Omer connects First week of Abraham, second week is Hak, etc. And every one of the weeks of the Omer connects to a different part of the human body. The sixth week of the Omer, which is the sixth Aliyah of the Shabbat Torah reading, connects to Yosef Asadik, which is the Yesod. Yesod in English means foundation. What part of the body does the Middah of Yesod connect to? You can draw your own conclusions. The area between the legs of the person. And that's why it's direct parallel to the mouth of the person. Same line. It's no detour. Like the heart and other body parts. Same line. Same line the mouth. Same line the berit mila, etc. So therefore it says that 
when a person receives such an aliyah, should have in mind to atone for those types of sins. Bielo tikkun gadol, and it will bring great healing to the soul of the person. And additionally, the person gets the aliyah to the sefer, and the person looks at the letters of the sefer, and the person looks at the words of the sefer, be'ahanele, and it will bring spiritual benefit to the person. Even though that Kabbalistically speaking, we don't have a clue what does it mean, the Yesod, the foundation, Yosef, but the idea is that we're doing the theoretical aspect and practical. And he concludes in a beautiful way that says, taher oto min hashamayim. That a person that takes these baby steps to purify himself, shamayim will give him a drive-through car wash for free. Meaning to say, will help the person to purify themselves in a holier and in a closer way to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. We can never minimize the power of the small things that we do. Every ma'asecha yekarebucha, every step and every action that a person does that is in a good and in a positive way to get close to God, that will be achieved. kahal kadosh, that the words of Torah of today elevate the neshama of Rut Mishan Kohen de Hilu Bad Latife, and Hamavdil gives refuah shelema to her husband, Haim Obadia Abdo Ben Zehie, among all of the holim of Am Israel, and we say Tiskela Mizvot to the generous sponsors of today's class. I'd like to wish everybody to have a great day, and Be'ezet Hashem will resume the class tomorrow uh, from a different location. I'm going to be heading out of town. Uh, I'm not going to be in Brooklyn for those asking. I'm going to be Be'ezet Hashem in theory, weather allowing and God wanting uh, in the city of uh, Lakewood uh, for a personal simcha, and Be'ezet Hashem will broadcast live uh, as every day. Be'ezet Hashem, I already got permission from my dear wife uh, to devote these few minutes that we learn Torah daily, so we have the continuity of the Torah class. Have a great day, everybody, and Be'ezet Hashem, we'll see each other 9.15, 9.20, via itorah.com. Have a great day.